Well, hey everybody, this is Pastor Dan of the Journey Church in Chesapeake, Virginia. Welcome to our online experience. I'm so glad you're here. We're actually starting a brand new series today, and I want to tell you that the best way to get this experience is to download the JC app. It's the place where we connect both our in-person and online presence. It's the way you can find out what we're doing. It's also the way you can download notes for today's message, see previous messages. You can give on the JC app. You can find out how we're serving the community and you can get involved. So download the JC app. I'm hoping that you'll connect with us. Now, having said that, I, I want to tell you that I'm looking forward to this next series that we're doing called <laughs> Life Ain't Easy. And I'm, I'm praying that this message will help you have some clarity and some wisdom in a very crazy time that we seem to be living in. So I just want to say we're going to have a time of worship together in music and in message. And uh, we, split the, we split this up into three parts so that you can have discussion. There's no reason for you to just watch it all the way through. You can watch it to a point. We have a shared question you can talk about. I want you to do that, to think, reflect, discuss what we're talking about today and the scripture we're using. By the way, just so you know, we're talking about the letter of Paul to the Colossians in the New Testament. So... If you want to get ahead, you can just read that as we go through this series over the next few weeks. All that being said, let's get started. Grander earth has quaked before Moved by the sound his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Through it all Through it all My eyes are on you and Through it all Through it all It is well
We're starting a brand new series today called Life Ain't Easy, Finding Hope in Hopelessness. And I think that it's timely for us, especially after Easter, as we proclaim that we believe Jesus wants you to have a real life now and forever. In fact, a resurrected life that begins when you start following Jesus through death into this new life. A few weeks ago, I came across an article that said anxiety and depression are getting better since the end of the pandemic. And so I wanted to kind of include that in this series and talk about it, and then uh, I couldn't find it. In fact, it was hard to believe for me anyway. You know, if you consider that if a child was eight years old when the pandemic began, at least 10% of their life was lived in restricted isolation. We saw our loved ones less. <laughs> we tried to figure out how to be cautious and not be ridiculous. And I have to tell you, I'm not sure we got that right all the time. I have this five-year-old grandson who has spent half of his life in some kind of isolation and an 11-year-old grandson who will tell you with contempt in his voice and on his face he hates COVID and every family had to go through it in some way. What do we tell him? What do you say? Life ain't easy. Life ain't easy. Every family had to go through it in some way. And while all of us are going through this crazy time, Politicians, talk shows, editorials, TikTokers, and YouTubers, they're all spouting one opinion or another, all positioning themselves as wise. And all of them seem to be using war language, like uh, there's some kind of battle in which there may be, or ought to be, casualties. It's a war for being right. Each narrative using this war language. You have to fight for this issue. You have to take action. We are at war for the soul of our country. Get out there and take no prisoners. All of these narratives just trying to pull us apart. Really, just trying to get clicks, sell ads, all the expense of our sanity and peace. No, life ain't easy. But this isn't really new, this cultural pulling apart. It's been going on since people met in groups. In fact, New Testament writer Paul had to address this issue of polarity in the first century church, specifically at a church called, uh, or in the city of, Colossae. I think we have an adversary who seeks to leverage this kind of polarity for destruction. For my destruction, for your destruction, for our destruction. And I believe Paul had to speak against this. And instead of saying what you should or shouldn't do, he pointed to someone. He pointed to a person. You know, last week we said that Jesus calls us to new life. What does that new life, that resurrected life, look like in the world right now, practically? Where there is an enemy that seeks division, destruction, and uses a framework of lies and half-truths, all just to hurt us. You know, life ain't easy. Life ain't easy. But I believe that Christ is our wisdom that anchors us in hope. And that's what I want to talk about today. Would you pray with me? Father, as we look into your word, speak to our hearts and let us see your wisdom. Help us to understand the purpose of Jesus in our lives today, that we can live this resurrected life even in the craziest of times. Father, Father, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this church, Colossae, was planted by a guy named Epaphras. And he gives a report to Paul, who is a New Testament writer. He is himself a church planner. 
but he's in prison. And he's in prison for proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, which meant that Jesus is the one we're supposed to follow. He's supposed to be the center of our lives. This would have been totally against the narrative of Rome, which said that the Caesar is the center of your life. The Caesar is the semi-divine. The Caesar is the one you're supposed to follow. They wanted political unity, and yet Paul was saying something very different. He was in jail for that. When he hears about the polarity in Colossia, which basically amounted to this, there were people in this city who were sort of Greek in nature, and they were, they were proposing that people had to be open spiritually to new ideas, to some secret ideas that would reveal truth to them so that they would have the world, the universe, open to them. They were called mystery religions, and so there are people who are proposing all of these secrets, not like today, right, where we don't have anything like a book called that, or, uh, or maybe some people proposing that there are some spiritual insights that we've been missing all along. We, we don't get that, right? On the other side, there are people who, of the Jewish community who are saying, who, who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who's come, who lived and died and rose and lives and reigns, but they're saying that in order to follow Jesus, you must also follow all the rules of all the Old Testament, of all the, all the Torah, the teaching of Scripture for Jews. You have to follow all 613 of them and follow Jesus. And so there's this tension pulling them apart. And so Paul hears this story, and he's a bit worried about it. And he says, for this reason, since the day we heard about this, we haven't stopped praying for you, church in Colossae. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So Paul's solution, Paul's hope for them, is that in the middle of this tension, this polarity, that they might have the knowledge of God's will and his wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now let me ask you a question. Does this present culture stress you out? Hey, what worries you the most about your future or the future of your family? How do you deal with that? I want you to just kind of pause the video for a second and maybe you can talk about this a little bit, pray about this, reflect on this. If you're watching by yourself, journal about it. And then after we do that, I want to come back and I want to talk about where or who our wisdom is when we're living this resurrected life. So take a moment and we'll come back. What Paul says is this. He says, Jesus is our wisdom. Jesus is our wisdom. Now, let me just stop for a second and, and just dig in on this word wisdom. What is wisdom? If you look this up on dictionary.com, it says, the quality or state of being wise, knowledge of what is true or right, coupled with just judgment as to action, sagacity, discernment, or insight. So, there's a, there's a clue here about what's coming. There's knowing being and doing. You with me? This is knowing, being, and doing. All these add up to wisdom. Now, I really like the way uh, Andy Stanley in Georgia talks about this. He says that humility plus a biblical command in the catalyst of action yields wisdom. I believe he said something like that, but I'm just going to give him credit because he's really the smart guy. Humility plus a biblical command in the catalyst of action yields wisdom. Now, that sounds great, but have you noticed today that there are a lot of people claiming to be wise? And they're positioning like, you're blind, you're a sucker, you don't know, but I, I got the special knowledge. Most people claim to be wise than are actually wise. <laughs> here's some insight for you, here's some scriptural insight. This proverb from Solomon says, when arrogance comes, disgrace follows, but humility, but with humility comes wisdom. Have you noticed the arrogance speaking up lately? Have you noticed the people claiming wisdom? Have you noticed the bombacity of politicians and, and TV reporters and online reporters and YouTubers? With arrogance comes, when arrogance comes, disgrace follows, but with humility comes wisdom. Listen, to have wisdom for real life, you're gonna need to be wise beginning with humility. Humility is the beginning of wisdom. The second piece is a biblical command. 
the the Bible is not about so much following the rules as it is using it for guidance and direction. If you're on a journey in this new life, this is a, a guide. It is a guide. It is not an enslavement. It is a guide toward real life. And knowing the right thing to do from the guide and being humble enough to admit it is pointless if you don't act on it. But we all too often think we know best. We all too often weigh things out about how we feel and what we want and we make a decision and we arrogantly believe we know best. But when arrogance comes, disgrace follows. With humility comes wisdom. And Paul is telling the people of, of Colossae that it's not Christ and special mystery religion. It's not Christ and all the Torah. It's just Christ. Look, to have wisdom for real life, you don't need anything and Jesus. You need Jesus. And so here is how you get wisdom. Here's how you live in wisdom. And I just want to go a little bit theoretical for you a second. You need to Follow Jesus. Why follow Jesus? Look, I want to read what Paul writes about him. Here's what Paul says about Jesus and why we should follow him. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible, the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things are held together. He is the head of the body or the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that, we, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether on heaven or on earth or things in heaven, by making peace, peace, through his blood shed on the cross. That's a, that's a lot. But essentially, Jesus is the image of God. Jesus is the creator of all things. Jesus is the one who is there before. There's no one before, over, or after Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. And the resurrection makes him first, and death has no power off of him, Jesus restores the relationship between God and humanity. And because of the victory on the cross, Jesus brings a shalom, a perfect, a restorative peace. And so Paul says, you know, before things were a mess, but now because of Jesus, he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you as holy, faultless, blameless before him. Before who? Before God. Man, that's a lot. You want wisdom? Do you want real life? Do you want to do you want to really follow something that's going to get you to purpose and meaning and love? Follow Jesus. Look at what he's done. So let me stop. Let me ask you a question. How do you see Jesus? Do you struggle with the idea that he is at once God and human as Paul insists? Do you see Jesus as king? Do you see Jesus as savior? Do you see Jesus as a really good teacher of morals? Whatever it is, look, this is a big one. Jesus, Jesus is the key. Jesus is our wisdom. So I just want you to think about this for a second. Talk about it, reflect on it, pray, ask for insight, journal about it. Just take a moment and pause the video. And when you're done, uh, come back. And I want to talk about how we can practically live out wisdom So, if I want to practically live out the wisdom of Jesus, Jesus is my guide. I want to say this very carefully. So, we talk about Scripture, but hear me carefully. Jesus is my guide. So, the first thing I want you to think about is this, is that if Jesus is our guide, if he's the one we're following, then first, discover what Jesus said. And what he said that was wise. So here are four quick ones. What did Jesus say was wise? One of the things he said was repent. Now repent is not just saying I'm sorry. Repent is stop going your way and follow him. Jesus had a point where he brought this out. He says this to the people. He, he has a moment where he's like, this is the place where I'm going to start my ministry. And from then on, Jesus began to preach repent because the kingdom of heaven has come 
near right now. It's coming near now. So repent. Stop going your own way and follow Jesus. Another thing Jesus said that was wise, he said, seek God. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, your, your needs, your, your desires, your, your wants, your fulfillment, your purpose, your meaning, your love will be provided for you. Seek God. Repent. Another thing he says, and I think we missed this way too often, is he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow up me, let him take. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Jesus wants us to be selfless. He wants us to repent. He wants us to seek God. He wants us to be selfless. So those are three easy ones, but the big one I think that matters is Jesus wants us to love. And not love like I see it talked about in culture, but a love that is deeper and powerful and amazing. A love that puts others first. Jesus said, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. If you want to live out the wisdom of Jesus, seek out what Jesus said in the scripture that was wise. So you will know it. You with me? To know it. And then listen, I want you to adopt Jesus' attitude. Jesus wrote another church in the first century, a church in Philippi. And he talks about adopting Jesus' attitude, how we should experience or be. He said, adopt the attitude, the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. While he's God, he becomes a human. He was humble. He was being humble. So it's a knowing peace. It's a being peace. You have to be humble. And Jesus was humble even to the point of the cross. So seek, to see, seek what Jesus said was wise. Adopt the attitude of Jesus and then live out the wisdom of Jesus by seeking solitude with God. You tend to be more like who you hang out with. Seeking time to be present with God alone will have an impact on you that changes everything. And that's what Jesus did. Luke writes about Jesus' practices. And he said, but the news about Jesus, him, spread even more. And large crowds would come together to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. So people pressured Jesus to do what they wanted him to do. And yet, he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. If you want to live out the wisdom of Jesus, it's about knowing, being, and doing. It's about knowing what Jesus said that was wise. It's about being like Jesus and adopting his attitude of humility. And then it's like doing what Jesus did, not the least of which was just seeking to be alone with God to become more like him. If our faith is about a relationship, and it is, do that relational peace. It brings hope and a peace within you. It cannot be substituted. As God affects you and changes your heart and your mind as you pursue him, learn what he said, adopt his attitude, seek to act like him. As those things shape you, you're going to find that you're very different from the world around you. But I'd like to kind of wrap this up by talking about a very important line from a president of our country who was a warrior. President Eisenhower in the 1950s had served as one of the leading warriors of the Great World War, the Second World War. And as president, he said something I think we need to hear more often. Here's what he said. The hope of the world is that wisdom can arrest conflict between brothers. I believe that war is the deadly harvest of arrogant and unreasoning minds. 
And that bothers my soul because in our own country, that's all I see. Arrogant and unreasoning minds attacking one another, even using war language to create division and pain and hate and contempt. But we are called to live a new life. And in that new life, Christ is our wisdom. Christ is the one we follow. Christ is our guide. Christ is our wisdom that anchors us in hope. And if I'm thinking about hope for my future, I'm thinking I have no hope but Christ. Well, what are you facing today? What are you going through? I mean, all of us know the truth. Life ain't easy. In my home, we're going through some things with my, my older mother-in-law, and we're trying to sort that out. And sometimes we just don't care about what's on TV. Sometimes we are exposed to it, and it just bothers us that that's happening as we're just dealing with the turmoil of caring for someone we love. Um, what is the crisis you're going through? What is the turmoil you face now? Is it that at Thanksgiving table, different parts of your family have sealed themselves, sealed themselves off into factions, and so it's hard to have everybody together at the same table? Is that happening in your home? Can I trust Jesus to be my wisdom in the turmoil I face now? Not in self-righteousness, but in humility. Adopt Jesus' attitude and seek to act like Jesus, being alone with him and then living that out. I hope that's something you can do. May you reflect on this. May you think about this. As this video ends, I want you to think about how you can trust Jesus. Can you trust Jesus? Will you trust Jesus to be your wisdom? As Paul says, he completely is because He's before all things, and He's accomplished what we can never accomplish so that when we follow Him, we follow Him through death into life. May you know this. May this happen to you. Father, I pray for the people as they watch this that they may follow you, that they may follow you in wisdom and that life is poured out on them, and that the division and destruction and lies and framework that our enemy just pours out in different directions just to create separation, just to create destruction of families, that it be just halted in Jesus' name so that peace may be on the earth. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. May you be blessed so that you may bless others. You are sent.